going to continue our ecology unit and we are going to do lesson number two called community interactions. So take out your note taker that looks like this and you're going to fill in the notes as you watch my video lesson. Remember that if I'm going a little bit too fast, you can always stop the video, go back and um, re-watch certain parts. Okay, let's get started. So lesson number two, community interactions. So let's start with defining a habitat and then comparing that to a niche. So a habitat is an area in the environment when, where an organism lives. So it is a place where the species can find food, shelter, protection, and mates for reproduction. So think of it as its address. So for example, here you see um, the butterfly garden would be an example of those butterflies habitat. Now let's think about what threatens a habitat. So if you're thinking of a forest habitat, for example, what do you think would threaten that? Well, it's not a surprise that we humans, we are the main cause of habitat destruction. So habitat destruction is the main cause of biodiversity loss. So we destroy habitats to make room for crops, livestock, and the growing human population. So here you see that deforestation has destroyed about 99% of the original temperate forests to make room for um, our cities. Agriculture has replaced nearly all grasslands in North America, so we need to make room for our crops. And the world's 48,000 dams disrupt both aquatic and land ecosystems. So we need to have a, a reservoir of fresh water, but that's going to disrupt the ecosystems within our planet. So we humans, we are a major threat to our habitat, and we need to be aware of that because destroying our habitat has consequences. So what is a niche? A niche is a... Uh, the role the species plays. So each species occupies a niche in the community. So um, a niche is a, is a combination of many things. So it's the role the species plays. So it includes what that species eats, where they live, so habitat is part of the niche, and where it reproduces and its relationship with other species. So here are some examples of um, different organisms and their niche. So one example is a squirrel that collects acorns and buries them for winter. That's the niche for that particular squirrel. That's its role in the community. Another one is honeybees that gather nectar for flowers to make honeys. That's the role also as pollinators. That's their role. That's their niche. Um, other organisms that may exist in the same environment don't do this. So that means that no two organisms can occupy the same niche. So for instance, a bird may live in the same tree as a beehive, but the bird does not make honey the way the bees do, right? So no two organisms can occupy the same niche. Even if they are closely related, like these warbler birds that you see here, because they happen to be different species of uh, warblers, they cannot occupy the same niche. So even if they happen to live in the same spruce tree, um, they live in different parts of it, so they have a different habitat. Um, maybe they reproduce at different times of the year, and they feed or eat um, uh, different food sources. Okay, So that's something important to remember. No two organisms can occupy the same niche. So when we think of habitat destruction, we think of the organisms that we lose um, that live in that particular habitat. And because no two organisms can occupy the same niche, then that means that if the habitat is destroyed, then that niche is also destroyed. 
so think about how catastrophic it would be to lose the honeybee population, right? Because um, they are the only ones that can exist in that niche. They are a very um, important pollinator. And if we lose that, it would have repercussions um, in other populations and in other communities um, and in full in other organisms, um, ecosystems. So let's recall what are the biotic and abiotic factors. And you took notes on this um, in the lesson one note taker. So let's recall that biotic factors are um, factors that are living, like the organisms, plants, protists, animals, bacteria, fungus, all those organisms. And the abiotic factors are those factors that are non-living, like temperature, moisture, air, salinity, and pH. So it's important to understand that communities, which are a group of populations, right? So here we see, again, we see different populations of zebra, giraffes. So communities interact with different biotic factors. So um, what does that mean? That means that there is a symbiosis between organisms of different species. So that's what symbiosis means. Symbiosis means that there is a close relationship between organisms of different species. And the relationship can vary. Sometimes it can be a good relationship. Sometimes it can be a bad relationship. So you have three examples of symbiotic relationships. Mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. So in your notes, let's go ahead and define each of the three. And then we'll give an example. So an example of a mutualism or mutualistic relationship is where um, both organisms benefit. So I think of it as plus plus. Okay? So in this picture, what do you see as a mutualistic relationship? Well, right here, right? The butterfly and the flower. It is mutualistic because the butterfly is getting the nectar that it needs from the flower and the flower is getting pollinated um, by the butterfly. So that's a mutualistic relationship. Both benefit. What about commensalism? That means that one benefits, that's a plus, while the other is neither. Neither benefited nor harmed. So that's just zero. Okay. So which example here do you see as a commensalistic relationship? Okay, right here. So here we see Nemo, a clownfish, that lives um, within the sea anemone. So the sea anemone provides a habitat and shelter for the clownfish, but the clownfish doesn't really provide anything for the sea anemone, right? So the sea anemone is neither benefited nor harmed. And then finally, uh, parasitism, that means that one is harmed and one benefits. So of course here we see an example of a parasitic relationship and here we see um, a, a caterpillar and we see that this caterpillar has been invaded by these eggs. So what happens is a, a wasp can inject its eggs onto the caterpillar and then the um, the eggs, as they start growing, they start feeding on the fluids of the caterpillar. And obviously that's not good for the caterpillar, but it's good for the eggs, right? And then the larva. All right, so going back to this slide, we see that these communities can also interact with other biotic factors in a different way, right? And these communities can also interact with each other. So um, another example of organisms and their interactions is predation. So predation means that one organism, um, the predator, is going to kill and eat another organism. So this is an example of a community interaction. Um, parasitism is an example of predation, right? Because as we see here, the um, eggs were feeding on the caterpillar and eventually the caterpillar is going to die. Um, but here we also see an example of another predation, right? So we see the predator killing its prey, right? The snake feeding on this mouse. Another example of organism interaction is competition. 
appears when one organism competes with another to obtain the matter and energy it needs for basic resources, mates, and territory. Okay. So an example of a competition could be a competition within the same species. So um, here we see perhaps um, these tigers uh, uh, competing for a mate, for example, right? You can also have competition between different species. So um, species competing for water, competing for food. And cooperation means that organisms work or act together for common or mutual benefits. So we use mutualism as an example of cooperation, right? Um, the butterfly pollinating the flower would be an example of cooperation. Okay. So I wanted to show you um, this slide because it's going to take us into our next lesson. And um, this slide shows us how abiotic and biotic factors can act as limiting factors. So we're going to see how um, these limiting factors uh, can limit population growth. So communities interact with each other. And within those communities, we have the abiotic and the biotic factors um, working together, right? Um, but these biotic and abiotic factors can be limiting factors to population growth, right? So, for example, if you're competing for the same food, there's always going to be a winner, right? And then the winner is probably going to get to reproduce and produce more offspring, whereas the one that doesn't get enough food is going to die out. Same thing with predation, right? There's always going to be a, a, a winner. If, if, if there's predation and there is um, one organism that survives, then that means that the other population is going to be limited in, in, in growth. Same thing with parasites and disease, right? So if, if a population has a parasitic condition or a disease, we know that that's a limit to population growth. So we know that the Spanish flu, right, um, was a virus that killed a lot of people. We know the Black Plague was a virus that killed a lot of people. And we see that that is a way to limit population growth. Even now with COVID-19, we see how it's limiting population growth, not to the same extent that it would occur um, as far as other diseases and other organisms, right? But we see a lot of people dying, right? Not necessarily to curve the human exponential growth, but um, we see that a lot of people do die um, as a condition of these um, limiting factors. Weather and natural disasters can also act as limiting factors and they can also limit population growth, okay? So we're going to talk a little bit more about that in our next lesson, in lesson number three. But that's it for lesson number two. Um, so I hope you enjoyed it and have a great day.